excited to be bringing up onto the stage a great group to discuss. This is an interesting one, Damien. Sports as diplomacy and how to play the risk and opportunity. Please welcome from the Atlanta Falcons, my man, yes. Mac Hollins, who happens to not only be a wide receiver, but also an ambassador for the Special Olympics. John Gersma, the CEO of the Harris Poll. Jennifer Holleran, the CMO at Mass Mutual. Lisa Eichberger, the CMO of Ring Central. And our moderator, Stagwell Chairman and CEO, the man, Mark Penn. Come on up. Okay, wonderful. Well, uh, we're gonna do a little exploring about what's been labeled sport diplomacy, okay? Uh, I don't really know why they labeled it sport diplomacy. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about, you know, how you wend the risk and reputation out there, particularly when it comes to issues, you know, in sports. And uh, as such, I think it'll be a pretty interesting topic. I've got a great panel. Maybe you'll each introduce a little bit yourself as we go along. Uh, Mac Hollins, uh, who's, I think, probably the big draw for the panel myself. <laughs> okay. Definitely. Uh, I'm going to ask you first about, look, you went from a walk-on to the Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. Just give us a little background on your journey. You know, this panel is about risk. What were some of the risks that you took uh, in that journey? And we'll start off and kind of, everyone will kind of in this first round introduce yourselves to the, to the group and we will take it off from there. Mac. Well, first off, I want to thank you, Mark, for setting all this up. This has been incredible for me, for my wife who came. Um, it's such an amazing experience meeting everybody on this panel as well as others. Um, but my journey started in Rockville, Maryland. I'm one of three boys. Uh, so dad ran a tight ship with all boys in the house. Uh, I'm the middle, middle child. My older brother's in finance, my younger brother's a Marine, and I chose sports as my kind of gateway. Uh, I ended up walking on it in North Carolina. And before I got to North Carolina, my dad said, you can go to the military or you can go to school to play football or go to school, but you're not staying on the couch. So I decided I would go uh, play football. So walked on and two years into my time there, I was able to get a scholarship. But I think the biggest risk in that moment was I told myself in two years, if I don't have a scholarship, I'll go somewhere else where I can get one. So it almost forced me to attack every day of, hey, I, if, I gotta get this scholarship, gotta get this scholarship. Uh, and then I was able to two years later and then I look three years later, I'm a Super Bowl champion, uh, which is one of the coolest experiences Woo! of my life. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I was able to take down the great Tom Brady, um, or the team was, but he still has a few more than, than me. Uh, but, but it was amazing, and life's full of risks, and football's full of risks, and business is full of risks. Uh, but I guess you learn how to get comfortable in those risks. The more you do them, the more you take, take shots at things, the better and more willing you are to, to do more of them. Can you tell us a little bit about some of your work with the Special Olympics? Yeah, absolutely. So Special Olympics has been a, a big part of my life since I was young. I had a neighbor growing up who was a Special Olympics athlete. I had a, my best friend in college. His brother was a Special Olympics athlete, so I was always going to events. Uh, and then all of it really culminated in 2019. I got a, uh, an opportunity to become a Special Olympics champion ambassador where I was able to do a lot of things with inclusion, the inclusion revolution, education. And I honestly didn't know much about the education side of the Special Olympics. I thought it was all sports and they do amazing sport work, but I learned how much they do for inclusion and unified champion schools and bringing those with and without intellectual disabilities together. And it's been such an amazing ride. And the World Games were this week in Berlin and it's been so amazing to be a part of that. Fabulous. Uh, Jennifer? Uh, maybe give us a little insight into your work as CMO of Mass Mutual, and particularly the community responsibility work that you're that you're leading. Thank you. Um, so I've been at Mass Mutual about uh, almost seven years now. They hired me to rebrand a 175-year-old company, 
um, and mutually owned, which means that we are super conservative and uh, not public. So a lot about um, the opportunity to bring a new brand in and teach an organization what brand is. Um, and we, I also have the um, good fortune to run our um, foundation. And we have a couple of programs that are national programs. We focus on financial literacy for children and um, economic underserved uh, communities. So we have a lot of great work out there right now. We have something called the Live Mutual Project which is where we um, work with uh, areas across the country that they call financial deserts, which means there's no banks and no financial institutions in there. And basically, they're at the mercy of payday loan vendors. And um, really, it's, it's a tough place to get out of economically or even prosper uh, when you can't find anyone to pass you, cash your uh, work paycheck every week. So we work with each of those communities. We bring social capital and financial capital together. Um, we don't have the answer. Every community's got a different problem, um, but we help them get get the, some sense of financial institution that will support um, those, those really low-income uh, communities because they'll never be able to break out of it. So we're really proud of that work. Thank you. John, you're CEO of the Harris Poll. I, I know you've got some research that you're going to be releasing in a day or two. Maybe you can give us a little preview without the numbers. Uh, of what's, what you're finding out there when it comes to sponsors and politics. Sure, Mark. Um, one of the things that we've seen in our new Axios Harris Poll 100 is a fatigue in um, speaking out on social issues. And it's not to say that ethics and values aren't important in corporations, but what the public is saying is they actually want companies to prove it before they say it. And they felt over the past year that a lot of companies have been um, aggressively sort of, whether you could call it virtue signaling or over aggressively advertising, whether it's greenwashing or other things. And so the public has gotten a little cynical. 67% um, of Americans, Mark, say that um, when companies speak out on social issues, they think it's a marketing ploy. Um, and that's up 12 points from April. So it just shows the work that we have to do well, to a, actually do It's a good thing things. that Sport Beach is not a marketing ploy. <laughs> Without a doubt. So you're going you're gonna to be revealing that in a day or that, two. We're yeah. going to put you a little bit more. You bet. Lisa, your chief brand officer at Ring Central. Uh, maybe you want to just give us a, a little insight into you know, what you're seeing out there relative to responsibility. I think kind of the... Uh, the whole nature of the videos that Ring Central has created has created a whole new kind of almost surveillance product, and I don't know if that's actually. Like uh, I'm with Ring Central, not Ring. Ring, uh, so uh, different, Ring Central. Different brands. We'll take that. Um, I'm the SVP of corporate marketing, and yes. we actually do unified communications as a service. Absolutely. Um, I do apologize. Uh, that. That's okay. That's okay. It's a common common challenge. I oversee our ESG practice, however, yeah. and you know, it is really important to us that we're helping bring communication to people in places where maybe they don't have it. Mm -hmm. um, and prior to Ring Central, I oversaw brand marketing for farmers insurance. And one of the things about farmers that I thought was so amazing was we had a huge presence rebuilding homes and um, helping communities after Hurricane Sandy, after you know, various in initiatives that had nothing to do with our coverage. It was homes in communities, regardless if they were insured or not. We sent volunteers in along with other volunteer organizations to help rebuild homes. And I think when you talk about putting your kind of your money where your mouth is and it not being a marketing ploy, we actually never promoted it at Farmers. We just did it. And now I think they really have permission to talk about it if they want to in a very authentic, real way. And it, that when I look at kind of good examples of how to mitigate risk, and coming from insurance, that's obviously something that was always important to us. Uh, but you know, mitigate risk in how you are perceived. Doing it first and then talking about it is really the best way to go about it. And what are you focusing on at Ring Central on, in terms of ESG? Yeah, we're focused on kind of, I mean, a lot of things. Um, making sure that we have diversity within our own workforce. Uh, I mean, you know, the tech space in Silicon Valley, that it is very white male dominated. Um, so. One of the things I personally have focused on is building up more female leadership within the organization. Um, we're focused on making sure that people have access to phone service. So, you know, we sell phone service as part of phone video messaging. Um, so you're making it affordable for small businesses, bringing you know, more people along. 
And then just, you know, the overarching kind of different aspects of environmental social governance. I mean, video conferencing clearly helps lower carbon footprints. People don't have to get in a car, they don't have to get in a plane, they can just get on video and have the sort of communication we used to have face to face that we now do so often over video. So sure. environmentally. So obviously politics and sports are colliding uh, next to AI. It's probably one of the bigger topics here. Uh, is this creating a risk, an opportunity, uh, or something else? Maybe start off with Mac on that one. I think uh, it's more of an opportunity. As an athlete, I think you build a following and you become a role model for kids and adults as well. And you have a responsibility to speak up or hold a stance for something. That doesn't mean you have to be as public as some people have been. It doesn't mean you have to go out and tell people to vote for so-and-so or vote for this way. But being able to say, hey, this is what I believe is not a problem. I don't think you should feel fear in doing that, but you do have a role, whether you like it or not as an athlete with a following and a lot of people watching you every, every week or every day to speak up about things that you feel are unjust or might not fit your, your narrative. All right. All right, Jennifer? Yeah, I actually think it's a good thing. I think that, um, you know, similar to what you're saying, it, it, we as a brand, we work with these uh, teams or leagues or athletes, um, and we know that they have an opportunity with a huge following, which is why we follow and we invest in, in supporting sports. And if you can make an impact, like you're saying, and speak up about things that are important, you know you have a large base and it can, it can be for the good. And like you said, sometimes it doesn't need to be said or done differently, but um, I still think you know you're, these athletes are their own brands and if they have a way to show their values the way we try to as a brand, I, I actually think it can be for good. John, you're, you're seeing uh, a little bit more risk than opportunity lately in your numbers. Uh, what are some things that you're showing? Well, there's definitely a little more risk, but I think when you think about companies that have established track record, and Mark, we learned in our research that 82% of Americans, including nearly the same equal amount of Republicans and Democrats, trying to get them to agree on anything is kind of tough. They said that companies should speak out on social issues if they have an established track record, right? So if you walk your talk and if, you, you know, you were, you were already doing things. And so I, I'm thinking, you know, Mac, about the community with NFL and the flag football and the discussions we had earlier here. I mean, this whole focus on inclusivity. I mean, the NFL, so many women are fans and the flag football initiative, I think, is a great example of just a company owning its values and sort of navigating the politics of the world by just focusing on, on really important things. Yeah, they've done a great job with, with being able to include women and but actually building it up before they go out there and say hey look what we're doing for women it's like well, well show us first show exactly. us uh lisa opportunity or risk i yeah i think it's both um you know it's important i think to partner with athletes who share your values as Jen, jennifer says i think it's important to sh partner with value uh, impl uh, sorry partner with athletes that are going to be recognized on both sides if you are an organization that doesn't have a political stance. I mean, when I was at Farmers Insurance, we sponsored Ricky Fowler. He's just loved, right? And I actually have no idea what his politics are. He kept, keeps that to himself. And he's just a, you know, a loved golfer, and I'm so sad he didn't win on Sunday. Um, but that's, you know, that was one of the things about him that was important when we chose him. His, you know, his Q score is high. He resonates with people who aren't golf fans. He doesn't have a lot of risk associated with him. And you, know, you don't always know. Something can happen, someone can make a bad choice, and they suddenly become risky, but at least you can you know, look at them and where do they fit with your brand and make a, an informed decision. Mac, do you think uh, athletes uh, now are going to be as outspoken as ever, or do you think that they're going to pull back a bit, or what do you think is going to happen coming out of this environment? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I think Kaepernick is probably the most well-known athlete that's spoken out and Unfortunately, from a football side, it didn't go well for him. His career ended after you know, going to the Super Bowl and all these things, so he clearly had the talent. But from a brand standpoint, it was great for him. He did amazing stuff uh, with Nike and had the Netflix documentary and movie about him. So from that standpoint, it was amazing. So it's hard to tell what players are willing to do because it's, I, I think in, you know, in, in my mind or a lot of guys' mind, it's like if I stand up, I'm going to lose my football career, but am I going to get a movie? Am I going to get uh, a deal with Nike that says, like, hey, he stands up for what's right? 
because there were a lot of other players that were standing up. Kaepernick just happened to be the, the face of it, so he got all these things. But I think there's, like I said earlier, there's a role and there's a, that you play, and you have to be willing to, to stand up for some things because in the future, football ends. You can't go and try to be a brand ambassador for things and then, like, hold on, five years ago you didn't support any of this. What, what's the deal now? Did you just have a complete turnover? Well, uh, Jennifer, are you willing to write some uh, risk and reputation insurance for Mac over here? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I got it. Is got that going to be a product that, that you offer? Do you offer that kind of product? Uh, no, I, this is going to get really close. We do. I don't want to. We. It's life insurance, some of it, and it's life and disability. I'm getting nervous. I'm going to curse them. Now something's going to happen. I don't want to talk about it. We we have our top ten broker dealer though. So if you would like investing in financials, it's not just insurance. I'm feeling like I'm going to curse you by saying that now. <laughs> I might have to go into this business. It could be an opening. So, uh, but are you seeing in insurance? Are you seeing any kind of uh, uh, politics coming into it? Politics in terms of the way you have to write policies and the way you have to uh, sign people up. Yeah. I think it's um, not nothing directly. I mean, we we do a lot of uh, work in Washington D.C. around certain things that we think are important from health and wellness perspective as an industry. Um, I think that you know, in, with different types of insurance, specifically with life, it's really mostly health based. Um, so what I do think that we see is that some of the coverage is just indicative to some of the diversity and some, you know, the different um, health issues that just sort of run in that space, but it's nothing that's specifically called out. I would actually say the biggest place that we see um, a discrepancy or gap from um, being inclusive is with women. I mean, they tend to not have life insurance, and most of them are underinsured when they do uh, get a life insurance policy written. So we spend a lot of time focusing on that for sure. And John, any advice for athletes based on your research? Well, I hope there's a lot of marketers here that are ready to sign up Mac. I want Mac, hold up your watch. <laughs> Look at that. Can you tell the story about your, your watches? Oh, yeah. So uh, this is a Casio F91W. It's the only, only one I, I'll, I'll wear. So I have every single color. And every game since I've been in the NFL, I've worn an all-black version of this. Um, I love them to death. I, unfortunately, it will never be the guy that buys the expensive watch. Wearing a Rolex on the field and breaking it just hurts a little different than wearing the $10 watch and breaking it. So <laughs> these are my pride and joy. I, love that. I think Casio needs to give you a call. <laughs> I, I'll All right. happily All right. answer. All right, John, you're not getting out of that so fast, though. <laughs> OK, an athlete comes to you for a little polling advice. Well, I think athletes are brands. The way that they're connected with companies and like this panel's been talking about is you're trying to find the shared values that work between uh, the company and the athlete. And there's so many incredible examples of athletes doing amazing things for companies, clearly. And um, there's obviously some, some big misses, which creates significant risk as well. So, I, you know, I think it's more, I'm, I would defer to my insurance experts over here, but I would do a lot of research, Lisa, like you talked about with uh, Q scores, but to try to understand how the public feels about them. Or maybe there's a gap in what you're trying to get your brand across that that athlete, she or he, could, could provide. And so I think that would be my, my recommendation. Yeah, yeah and I, I agree with you completely. I mean, it's matching the athlete with the brand, making sure it's authentic, making sure that the athlete actually cares about the brand and it's not just taking a paycheck, um, and that they can represent the values that are important to you. John, is there an attribute that you think at the most important attribute for an athlete out there? Authenticity. Okay. And do you think uh, people know authenticity? I think they feel it. <laughs> they feel it in people that they've just met, like, you know, meeting Mac, for example. But I think that what's so important is that, and that's in all of our data, Mark, you know, like eight and 10 people are saying what's behind you is what's important. The other thing, Mark, in the data that we're releasing shortly is um, we asked this sort of real simple old-fashioned question. We said trust, you know, do you agree or disagree? Trust is old-fashioned, but it's now more important than ever, and it's nine in 10 Americans. Again, there's, I think trust is the new black. There's this big focus on trust being back in fashion because with AI and all these other things, existential threats, everything, it's the focus for grounding. We want to be grounded in people and values that we can really believe in. I always found when I was working with political candidates, which is a long time ago now, uh, that authenticity was very dangerous because 
I would know when they were authentic and when they were sort of like putting on a face. And then oftentimes they would be authentic and they would just get trashed for being inauthentic. <laughs> and then sometimes they were like, oh my God, that's total, I can't believe anybody's buying this. And everybody would come up to me, oh, they were so authentic today. So, I, I, you know, I'm always a little wary of that particular attribute as a result of that experience. Would you advise, like, when you'd worked with President Clinton, if there was polling that said he should act this way, or Hillary Clinton, would you say, go act this way? Or how would you give them uh, advice on that? No, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't really give them advice on, uh, on how to act. I just would observe sometimes that they would get very frustrated when they were called inauthentic, when they had actually been telling what they actually think. <laughs> so, so authenticity is in the eye of the beholder. Well, Oftentimes, I, I, it's just point. about what people want to hear. But it's right? also consistency, right? I mean, and that's anything, that, I mean, as, as someone who builds brands, that's one of the most important things is you're consistent in telling your story, you're consistent in what you do and say and how you behave, and everyone within an organization behaves that way. And that's where I think people feel the inauthenticity is when there's the flip-flop or the changing ways or not following values and mores. I, I absolutely. And so, so, Mac, do you have advice for a new athlete about how they develop a brand? Because athletes do their work on the field, but it seems like there's a job off the field now, too. Yeah, absolutely. I think the, at least when I approach a brand or a brand approaches me, it has to fit. And it kind of goes back to this authentic thing uh, that we're debating about. Um, if I don't use the product, if I'm not, if I don't really like the product, then I won't do a partnership with them. Um, if, if Coca-Cola said, hey, do you want to do a partnership? And I don't drink Coke or if I don't like their products, I don't want to see a fan someday and I'm not drinking Coca-Cola and they're like, hey, do you want one? And I'm like, oh, I don't like that. Because th this whole time I've built up this image of you should buy Coke because I like it. You should, do, you should drink this because I like it. And now I don't like it. And it's like this whole sham or charade that I've just played. And I try to approach every brand like that. Like going back to the watch, like I've always worn this Casio watch. I'm not partnered with them at all, but I like Casio. If I show up in some other watch, then it's like, Mac, I thought you were the Casio guy. Um, so being authentic and being authentic with the brands that you choose and not choosing a brand because they're giving you a better paycheck. Or, because I think long run, it pays off more to be who you are than it does to get a few pennies here and there to be something you're not. Is there a medium you think is, is, uh, is better or worse for, for athletes to, to kind of put their brand on? I think that's a difficult question because I think it's starting to bridge where guys are getting into the alcohol companies and you can't directly partner with them, but they, they get into that stuff or there's a million different drinks. I try to get with, for me personally, with brands that not a lot of guys have um, because I'm a unique guy. I don't wear shoes a lot of the time. I have snakes and I, I'm, I don't eat vegetables. So I, I do a lot of weird things. <laughs> and so the things that I like, I can't do. I'm not going to do the things just because everybody else is doing it. Or I'm not going to just partner because two of my teammates are like, hey, they'll pay you and you should do it. And like, that's not what I want to do. So I think the medium that a player chooses is really going to be up to him, but it has definitely branched out further than just the Gatorade, the Nike, the Adidas. All right. No spinach uh, ads from you, for sure. <laughs> no, no spinach. <laughs> just, just beef, meat, and organs. All right. <laughs> the, uh, so at Mass Mutual, do you use sponsorships much? Do you think that they, that they how they work uh, for you in terms of being an insurance? Yeah, we've actually had really good success with them. Um, we, when we started um, six years ago and I did the rebrand, we started to work a lot in um, media. We bought a lot of sports because I just think that live sports is a really perfect place for fans and for brands to connect. Um, and we, about a year and a half into that, started, uh, we've been, I think, our fifth year now as a national sponsor with the NHL. Um, and we had amazing success in that in getting a new fan base, a new audience, recognition, awareness. Um, it's not just about the eyeballs and the logos um, on the, in the rink for us. We, we um, partner with them on our foundation, our community programs, and we do a lot of activation around their events um, and obvious business hospitality. And then um, just this March with uh, the beginning of the MLB season, we um, became the official premier sponsor with the Boston Red Sox. 
So we have a 10-year deal with the Patch and basically taking over all of Fenway Park. And that's an opportunity for us to reach 24 million customers in audiences that we don't serve right now. So it's a lot of um, multicultural through, um, in, through baseball and um, diverse audiences. Um, so we're super excited about it. It's a ton of work, um, but we see a really great connection. And I think, you know, to what we were all talking about here before about being, why are you there in sports? is because I'm, I'm going to put my TV spots in those, in those tent poles anyways because we love the way people respond to sports. So um, those are two of our biggest uh, sponsorship strategies. We do a lot with the different community organizations too across the country, but um, really ha um, love being invested in sports. Those are our big ones. And, and Lisa, are you, have you had any particular experience? I guess you've had several jobs, and I guess you're an athlete yourself, really. Yeah. Uh, your, your experience with sports sponsorships yeah, you know, I, I've been involved in sports sponsorships most of my career. With Ring Central, we sponsor the Golden State Warriors. Uh, with Farmers, we have the Farmers Insurance Open. Uh, when I was with Pac Bell, Singular, AT&T, back in those days, we sponsored a whole slate of athletes, or not athletes, excuse me, of teams and, and sports. And I think, you know, one of the things for me that's very, very important is that you're not just involved on the day of the game, that you're involved across many things, and you're engaging and making it more than just an activation in a stadium. Um, it, it has to go broader, longer term, and you know, engage not just your customers but other people. So with like you know, the Farmers Insurance Open, just because that's easy to go to, that's a four-day event. But we did all kinds of uh, charity events around it, and then we kind of activated on it year-round to engage with golfers, with golf, and try and bring it even outside of golf to make it bigger. Um, you know, we'd have Ricky Fowler in commercials. Again, that Q score, you know, because he's liked outside of golf, made that work for us. Um, so, yeah, we, I look at sports sponsorships as something that need to go outside of the sports arena in addition to being inside to really benefit a company. Nice. All right, John, you're going to maybe close us down with just like one or two incredibly memorable statistics from your polling. Uh, come on, you've got to give us a little edge here. Uh, the percentage that want to see sports sponsorships, percentage that don't want to see uh, involvement in politics. I don't know. Give us a little something here to close us out. Okay. Um, in our Axios Harris Poll 100 this year, the, in the top five most respected companies, number one was Patagonia, number five was Chick-fil-A. And I would like to imagine those companies' corporate picnics that get merged together <laughs> to see how that day would go. But the point is, 60% of Americans also say it's important for companies to show their values, even if I don't agree with them. And so I think it's back to that idea that you were talking about, you know, Lisa, is like just the aspect of consistency. So whether you're, you're a Democrat or Republican in the middle, somebody can at least agree that, that they're being true to themselves. All right, well, I just want to thank you for the incredible diplomacy showed by this panel. Uh, they did not get into trouble while talking about very delicate topics here at all, and I think the future of sport diplomacy uh, is in good hands, and the future of sports sponsorships, I think, going to be right, quite strong, even, even during this uh, incredibly hectic political season. So thank you all. Have a good thank afternoon. You. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. That concludes our stage sessions here today at Sport Beach. We have more kicking off again tomorrow at midday. Uh, we're now going to set up for free play for the sports. So I can, uh, if I can.